Amos chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Amos chapter 4. Father, we're so thankful for this day's together. The fellowship has been rich beyond words. Your presence has been real. If we leave here without, it's all our fault. We, it was here to be received, the presence of God. The message has gone forth. Our pastor dealt with us about the difference of strength and power. Dear God, what a message, what a hope as we realize when you said be strong, then everything is there. When we're weak, we are strong because we recognize where that strength. Now bless the message this morning. Help us to hear, to believe, and to be in the name of Jesus. Hear this word. <clears throat> you kind, Abishan, that in the mountain of Samaria, which oppressed the poor, crushed the needy, say to their masters, Bring and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, lo, the day shall come upon you, that he'll take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. You know, David spoke of bulls. He spoke of the bulls of, 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 of Bashan. Amos speaks of kind. Now, I tried to find what that means. It's another word with a more subtle meaning that cannot be expressed in terms. That word kind cannot be expressed in terms. But the whole nation at the time that Amos come was very much like the time in which we live in. The nation of Israel was the Old Testament church. And he's talking about the world has always been lost. That's the reason Christ died. So you understand, he's not trying to make this a better world. He's dealing with you and I that are the nation. You know, I made a study of Jerusalem, and I discovered that Jerusalem, which is a center of this w earth we live upon, it, it is made up of all, it, you know, it is a, it is a, a conglomerate of all the, the things that surround it, all the land that surround it, then all of those features are found in Jerusalem. Now when you bring that into the church, Christ is the land. And all the features of Christ should demonstrate what we are all of the time, nothing else. Everything about us should point to Christ alone. But the whole nation, when Amos was preaching, had sunk into sensuality. The whole thing, it was a physical thing. That's where we are today in the church. The whole thing ha has become sensual, physical, where there's no looking at the spiritual. The whole thing has to do with more money, prosperity, all of these kind of things. Every letter you get from one of those charlatans out there tells you how uh, that you can get rich, what you'll do this. Uh, one letter come had a little candle in it about this high. And one of the big, big names of the whole thing, his name was Old Roberts, in case you never heard of him, but that little candle was in that letter, and it said, now you light this candle, hold it in your hand, and make your, uh, make your greatest uh, request to God, then send this candle back to me with your Best seed faith often. Of course, don't send it back without any money in this envelope, but you send it back with the greatest seed faith offering that you can. And then I'm going to melt all of these together. Amen. And you're going <coughs> to get your miracle. Sound like witchcraft to me, but I said to the man, I never got the letter, but I said to him, I'm going to go to Tulsa pretty soon because that's going to be the largest hunk of wax on this earth when three million candles are melted together. All of this kind of stuff, see, comes out of that sensuality. When that thing becomes flesh, anything, I said, anything can come. One of the largest churches in Cincinnati last year, the preacher opened a can of beer on the platform, on television, said, this is the second one today. I believe we ought to act in church like we are at home. I said, I believe that. If you're a donkey at home, I ought to know it. I know not to come here. Amen. I'll know to take my place somewhere else. 
All of this, you see, and this is what it was with Amos. This is exactly what it was. The whole society spoken to by this farm boy turned prophet had sunk into the worst kind of selfishness their whole life. People go to church to get. We've created a parasite of the pew, and if you don't satisfy his desire, he's going to find some place it does. He didn't come to give nothing. He come to give, and the whole thing has to be registered to that. Now, <clears throat> you note it. The whole society. Amos does not choose his words with any view of consulting the taste of his hearing. He's not a user-friendly, folks. No, he never asked them what they wanted to hear. He knew what they had to hear. His whole thing. He must get their attention. Now, there are prophets today, I'll, I'll listen to them, who are speaking to the taste of the age. And the age takes no heed of their words. None whatsoever. Amos comes crashing down on the corruption of his day. He addressed them if it gathered in a stable that hadn't been cleansed for a century. Amen. All the dung is still there. Everything is there. And he dressed them with that. We must not send dainty men to do rough work, folks. Amen. That little tender-fingered man is not for this times. Amen. We need to leave the priest in his office, and it's time for the prophet to come back to the pulpit. Time for a man that will dress himself to the issues of our time. It, 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 is, it is way past, amen, the noonday. The sun is going down. He said to Amos, what do you see? He wasn't looking for information. He just wanted to make sure that prophet saw the right thing. He, see, he said, I see a basket of from summer fruit. You know what he was saying to that Amos? He was saying, son, it's all in that basket. There is no more. I can tell you we're on the threshold of the last apple being put in the basket, folks. If we're not careful, we're going we're gonna to leave a lot of people without all of this mess that's come into the church. Now Amos said, the Lord God has sworn in his holiness. Nothing short of the holiness of God is a pledge, is pledged and involved in this argument. Nothing short. You understand? God doesn't swear by his majesty. He swears by his holiness. You never see. You know, we know how to emphasize. We, we, we underline. We bold. We do this. We put in princes. But God repeated, verily, 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 these kind of a thing. But here in the Bible, he said, holy, holy, holy. He never one time said, love, 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 or grace, 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 but holy, holy, holy. God never, listen, God never swears by his majesty, but by his character. Always. It is because he is holy that he's going to take action today. It is because of the holiness of God that he has to deal with the things that have come today in this, in this time. Wherever, whenever and wherever. Holiness is involved in a controversy. Know that the most obstinate persistent, force known to man is engaged in that contention. Whenever a holy, always be afraid of an opponent who's working along the line of a noble character. Always be afraid of that man. I, I know those preacher politicians, I, I've never, they've never worried me at all. But when you face that man of a noble character, always be afraid if he's on the wrong side. The holy man is the most determined opponent upon this planet. Amen. Determined opponent to evil. The political economist is a calculator, an arranger. He'll always give away under pressure. Always. You, you've got that. John Hagee's, he says that Rome is that whore of the revelation. I've known that ever since I've been saved. But when the pressure come on him, all of a sudden he says, I'm wrong. He believes nothing. He's, he moves by the latest pole. Had nothing in his life that makes him. You said you ought not to call his name. Well, Paul called it. He said, Alexander the coppersmith done me a lot of harm. What he was saying, preacher, if he sits down in your church, don't let him talk. Don't let him get up. He's going to prophesy, say, sit down. 
This, this, you understand, we've got to know. The Bible said to me, know them that labor among you. If you know something I don't know, for God's sake, tell me. I'm not a suspicious man. I'm not trying to find what's wrong with people. So always that, 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 the mess, the, uh, determining and the understanding, uh, doesn't always work. Because I'm not, I'm not suspicious. I want to believe everybody's all right. But if you know what I don't know, then please, for God's sake, call a name. Why shouldn't we call a name? This is the whole of it. See, holiness never gives away. Fire never gives in. I said fire never gives in. And fire of a divine heart is enlisted against all men who oppress the poor and crush the needy. That's what we have here. Find a preacher who is a religious politician who operates only from political considerations and he'll be here today, there tomorrow, listen to hear what the latest poll has said. He'll calculate, he'll arrange, and he'll adjust. Every time. You, you just know what he said today doesn't mean that that's what he's going to say next Sunday. You just follow it all the way through because the times may change. I said the times may change. You know, Jesus Christ preached. He come as a preacher and he's called you and I to do the same thing. We that are called of God, every one of us are priests of God, we're to talk for God, but that pulpit is a place that governs that church, what that church believes. You know when you're in that church, this church is what that man of God is. If there's a lot of games being played, he's a game player. That's all there is. He's called servants to do the same. And preaching is the greatest instrument in stirring human minds and molding society. When that pulpit become a place of entertainment, then the world lost its focus altogether. I said they didn't know what to do. There was a time in this nation when every politician was looking over his shoulder to see what that pulpit had to say about what's going on. All of a sudden, that's not the way it is anymore. What, whenever we hear a preacher who speaks the right word, we hear God and nothing can ever be the same again. That man that speaks for God, you've heard the triune God, and nothing can ever be the same again. Preachers may fail, but preaching as instituted by Jesus Christ and exemplified in his own ministry can never cease to be the most effective agency in humanity. Nothing like the preaching of this gospel. That man that dares to preach and proclaim whatever he knows to be truth, regardless of what the situation, the outcome, he never calculates. There's no one more essential preacher than the preacher of the gospel of Christ. Oh, God, that I can tell you. I, I argued with myself. Amen. Brother, I talked to Brother Kirby. I said, you know, God is so dealt on this line. <clears throat> I said, I, last, I told you last night, I had two I knew I had to close it with, uh, figuring out which one of them was, first or last. And I put this, because I know most of us, amen, others have to work. Most of us in this house this morning are either preachers and their wives, evangelists, pastors, or whatever. And I want to tell you, there's no one on this planet more essential than you are. If you're a preacher by trade, you're nothing. You, you are a harlot. You're playing games with God. But if you've been called of the Almighty, amen, to be a preacher of this gospel, then there's nothing more essential than you are on this planet. Preaching will be powerless except in the proportion as it relates to and exalts Christ in this gospel. It's absolutely nothing. Christianity is a gospel. It's not an argument. We don't sit around, talk to Buddhism. No, sir, we proclaim a truth. You accept it or you don't accept it. All debaters go to hell. Why should I debate with a Hindu? 
This is the truth. I can't prove it. It proves itself. Amen. It proves itself. Christianity is a revelation, not a contention only. Christianity is a redemption, a baptism of blood, not an unholy fray, a chatter with evil speakers. This is to be thundered to a world by men that's called of God. There is no other answer to the day in which you and I live. The preacher should never meddle with merely controversial subjects. It's not his apology. This is an eternal world. I watch America disappear, mister. It said in Pravada, that's the main newspaper of Moscow, that America has turned Marxism quicker than any nation on this planet. Well, that ought to drive me crazy, but it doesn't. I don't belong here, folks. I said, I don't belong here. I'm a citizen of another world. Oh, yes, sir. I must know this is not my home. Make no mistake about it. I've loved this land. I appreciate God let me live here. I've been to places. I said, I've been there. I know how others have had to go through. I'm thankful for it. But I'm always aware that this is not home. I said, we're not home yet. Christ, as a preacher, was a word made flesh. And I believe you and I in this building this morning should strive to be the incarnation and the perfection of God. That's our whole life. That's called of God. The basis of Christ's ministry was solid character, and so it must be with us who would preach this gospel. It has to be with us. We have a distinct gospel to proclaim. Not a, not a lot of foolishness. Not a lot of things I hear in the pulpit has absolutely nothing to do with this gospel. What a sad thing. But if we are faithful our calling, this gospel will prove to be the power of God. Hallelujah. We've heard that from Brother Schutz. We've heard it from Brother Downs. If you're faithful to this gospel, it will prove itself. It may not prove it tomorrow, but tomorrow, day after, it will come to pass Hallelujah. I know it's difficult. I know what the pastor said. I made a statement some time ago. I said, in 56 years of a preacher, there have been lots of trouble. I said, been lots of problems. But I can look back and I'll tell you folks, most of those problems wasn't because I was wrong, but because I was right. Hallelujah. Hell never attacks what doesn't bother him. I said, hell never attacks what doesn't bother it. It come because that you're right. If hell's beating on your front door, you better be glad the back door's locked. And if you don't get there, he'll get there before you. That is, if you're proclaiming this gospel of Christ, the preacher, listen, we have a distinct gospel, and it'll prove itself. The preacher must know what the Lord would have him to say, then say it regardless of whether man hear it or not. For Moses was disturbed as to whether Israel would listen to him. But God said, that's not your problem, son. You say what I tell you. If they refuse, you've won the war. Amen. Everybody you don't save, you'll damn. Amen. You'll miss nobody if you'll be faithful to what I say. The goats may walk out. Let them walk. My God, we're not dealing with goats. We're dealing with the sheep. We're dealing to make men like Christ. May our faithfulness ever, ever be this. Amen. The preacher must speak with distinctiveness, simplicity, kindness, earnestness, and let the speculative go and let it wait. The pulpit has given too much away. I say that without fear of contradiction. Amen. The preacher should stand upon the top place church because that church lives or dies by that preacher. He must occupy that place. Doesn't matter. They said, you're a dictator. Call it whatever you want. Doesn't matter to me. I know this church is going to believe what I preach. This church believes what that man of God preaches. Amen. That, that's all. Whatever he lets in here is all gets in here. Amen. I, I just know. Men stand. Men try. Uh, you know, I had a great... 
a missionary, I use according to man. I had him in my pulpit. He got up there. He began to sing the praises of, uh, of Mother Teresa. You know, all of this, making her some kind of a great saint. Well, I bit my tongue. My wife said I was terrified. I knew you was going to get up. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I, I maybe should. But that night, I told him in the back, I said, we don't believe a word you said, mister. I mean, I want that woman to be saved, but she's not a saint. She told Hindu, be a good Hindu, and you'll make it. She told a Muslim, be a good Muslim, a Christian, be a good Christian. I said, I, I, no more of that in this place, you understand. We do not believe that here. We're not liberal-minded. We're gospel-minded. If that's narrow to you, my God, let it be narrow. I pastor long enough to watch this nation become transit. They move in. They move out. Family move into town. Come to the church. If they hang around a week, I know they like something about it. So they're going to be a little while. They're going to want to talk to me. So I just wait. When I get there, they say to me, we love the singing. We, we love the preaching. But that goat comes. See, that going to butt something around here. Uh, but, uh, well, all of a sudden, but what? Well, what have you got for young people? What do you got for divorced people? What do you got for this people? I said, let me tell you something. We got one thing for every human that walks through that door, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah to God. You won't find any gymnasium on this property. And as long as I'm in charge of it, there never will be. We don't eat, drink, rise up to play. We come to this house to hear from heaven. We come here to walk out here to live for Christ. Nobody said it's easy, but it's reality. I said it's reality. The preacher's message and mission is twofold. He is to tell the truth as it is in Jesus, but he almost also must take the stand before them as one that's come to deliver them from the personal power of the devil. That preacher's here for that. He must know that. He must know that. When they heard these things, they were filled with wrath rose up and thrust him out of the city, led him into Brow the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. That's in Luke 4. Now, is there any such reaction to the pulpit today? The greatest desire of the modern preacher is to be accepted by the multitude. He wants to please the people. wants to be loved by the people. Who does it? But who going to risk his whole eternal life just to please somebody who don't like what he's doing? Amen. Whenever did the congregation rise up, fill with wrath, seize the minister and try to kill him in our day? This is not some crazy off the street. This is religious people seized him, Christ himself, because they didn't like what he said. Going to throw him over a hill. They would do the same today if we'd preach apostolically they lay hold of us. I can tell you. There's no power to compare with the Christian religion when it comes to exciting the worst passions in a man. There's nothing. Nothing will ever. Christianity either kills or saves, but I'm afraid we've become so familiar with it externally as to cast by our own spirit and demeanor a doubt upon that proposition that it either produces death or life. The age of seized. What is known as horror of dogmatism. We don't want the preacher to be absolute about nothing. Oh no, leave plenty of room for everybody to get in here. But this gospel leaves no room for nothing but Christ. Nothing. Amen. There's not a parallel line. There's a point. You either going to jump the fence or get in somewhere. I said somewhere if this gospel is preached, you're either going to get in or jump the fence. There's no possibility of it being otherwise. Christian is nothing if it's not dogmatic, no reason for existing if it's not positive. It's not a suggestion, it's a revelation. It reveals, it announces, it proclaims, and it thunders, God help us again. Preachers of this gospel, we pass along easily because we annoy no man's prejudice. No, no. We dash no man's gods to the ground. We step on no man's idolatries so we don't have any martyrs. 
I said, we don't have any martyrs. We don't read where a Pentecostal preacher got killed because we don't, we don't stamp on anybody's martyrs. We try to keep it safe. We give everybody an opportunity to be in, claim to be positive. You know, let me tell you, it's not the Osteens, it's not the Copans, it's not the John Hagees. No, no. We in this room, we, it, it, it is you and I in this room who will cause this river to flow or not. Not, not them. Nobody out there can hurt me. No, it's in here. I said it's in here. We determine in this room, preacher, you and I will determine where this river flows. It doesn't matter what they do. You know, Elijah, when he got the Carmel, the first thing he did is rebuilt that altar. He got that prayer life back in place. Amen. But he let them go. They went through all day. He mocked them. Holler a little louder. Maybe your God's asleep. Amen. He cried at them. But when that time of that evening sacrifice come, amen, he mock all day long. But I'm telling you, if he don't pull fire down, they're going to stone him. Not enough for me to know what's wrong. I must produce what's right. Anybody, I said anybody can produce what's wrong. Man, my, my good friend was talking. I was in a church. They were a long ways from what we are. And he said, why are you doing here? I said, dear sir, if I get so holy I can't deal with people that need God, I'm in bad trouble. I said, I'm in bad trouble. Amen. I wouldn't have these people preach to me. But if they invite me, I'm coming to tell them that there's one answer under God. I, I'd preach to that Pope, but I wouldn't let him in my pulpit. He needs this gospel. God help us in this awful hour. Amen. Listen, they find a man whose conviction is alive, whose mind has become a moral organ, whose soul is committed to the cause of right, he'll never yield. One of the greatest friends and one of the greatest mentors to this preacher's life was a name, man by the name of J.C. Hibbard in Dallas, Texas, a man of God. I preached for him the first time he ever had me to preach for him. Uh, I, I, when I stepped up the pulpit, taped to the pulpit, there was this 8 by 10 or 12 page, however big this is, and it said, get going or get gone. <laughs> He's sitting over there in the chair. I said, what does that mean? He said, that means if you don't have anything to say, sit down. <laughs> He said, there's 12, 1,500 people in his church One bad service, 300 of them stay home. I don't have no time for that. Amen. I don't have no time. I began to preach. Oh, God, come into that room. He pulled his chair right here. Sit down right here. Here he is <laughs> watching, watching me preach this gospel. But that, in that meeting, I remember first night, hypothetically, John was his name, the song leader. He said, John, get the fire in your soul. Sunday, said, you're playing games with me. Get the fire in your soul. Well, Tuesday night, he said, John, I said, get the fire in your soul. Wednesday night, he said, John James will lead the singing tonight. No playing, no games with nobody. At flesh, you're not going to function on this platform. You're either going to be right or you're wrong. And if you're not going to get right, sit down. There's people in this house that will. People here that will get right. He told me, he said, you know, when I built this church, that's the one he, he, he later built another before he died. But he said, I'm in here with an apron and my hammer and nails are working. And four men come in here bringing a man on a stretcher. The man, nothing but skin and bones, had an oxygen deal in his nose. And they, they said, Brother Hibbert, we've heard you on, on the radio. And, and, and we brought this man. He had no hope. He's dead as far as the world's concerned. He's eaten up with a cancer, every organ. He said, I lay the nail hammer down. And I went over, laid my hands on him in the name of the Lord. And they took him out. I went back to build it. He said, about a month later, a man come to me after the service, three-piece suit, and said to me, do you remember me, Brother Hibbert? No, I don't. He said, well, I'm the man on that stretcher. I'm the man with that cancer. I'm the man that was dying. Said, I'm healed. God healed me that day. 
And he gave me a blank check signed. And he said, I'm an old man in Oklahoma. And said, that check's good for anything up to five million dollars. He wrote the check for a dollar and fifty cents. The man said, are you crazy? No, sir. No old man in Oklahoma is going to say he built this church. That's integrity, brother. That's the reason the sick were healed and devils run. He named, you couldn't buy that altar is what I'm telling you. That, that man, a man of integrity, he was what he was. Whether he had a dime or a dollar, it didn't make any difference. I said, what you thought made no difference to him. Such a man cannot be changed. He's representative of an eternal principle, an unchangeable standard, and all truth must become a moral conviction. Oh, no, you just don't preach tithing once a year and make it a moral conviction. That's the reason the average church, about 29% of the people tithe. I said about 29% of the people tithe. It's not a moral conviction. A man must preach what he believes. Amen. Till men believe it. I read where an old preacher took a church for six weeks. Every single service he taught on repentance. He preached repentance. Well, the board called and said, do you know anything else? Well, certainly I do. When are you going to preach it? When you repent. Why in the name of God should he give us anything else if we're not using what we have? <laughs> Dear God, will you hear us? Will you hear us this morning? Amen. We have an intelligence of a certain kind, the plenty. The conscious must be enlisted intelligently, thoroughly, passionately. And it takes the preacher. Some preachers are afraid to preach the message a second time. I preached Sunday morning. I said to my wife, honey, they never heard me. What are you going to do? I'm going to preach it tonight. Yeah. What an awful thing when you're afraid to preach. I can tell you there's more in resurrection than there ever was in birth. You go back to some of those old sermons, you didn't know what you said to yourself. Listen, conscience has been lost. Church without a conviction is a creed, a creed, and a creed without conviction is a corpse. Amen. It's a corpse. The Lord is not set against wrongdoing that you and I have to appease his passion. He's set against evil that you and I can satisfy his moral judgments as to what he has to say. Not what that preacher has to say. Not what that preacher thinks. But what God has to say. And until the ride is done, nothing is done. It's in vain to decorate the walls if it's a crack in the slab. It's crazy for us to go around trying to daub paint on the wall. The Lord will have nothing done to the wall until that foundation is put right. I said he'll never have nothing. We serve a holy God that does not look for our paint. He admires of being firm, honest, and trustworthy. Anywhere, everywhere, all the time, I'm a man of God. Amen. I get on an airplane and look like they got their pajamas on. I get on looking like this. Why? You're going to be comfortable. I am comfortable. But I represent something. I represent the kingdom of God. If I look like a tramp, who's going to listen? A, 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 a stewardess said to me, she said, there's a time when every businessman got on this plane and had a suit and said, there absolutely was no trouble. I can tell you, when that casual thing came, everything else, if I don't care how I look, I don't care how I live. And it comes to that. I represent a king. I represent a kingdom. I represent this great and holy God. Hallelujah. We serve a holy God. And he said to me, you be holy like I am. Amos, the farm boy, now begins to speak in, in a tone of irony, a kind of mocking. Listen to it. It's a marvelous to see how these farm boys and others suddenly become educated in great eloquence. I, he said, I, I come a farm. My dad was no preacher, no prophet am I. Amen. In other words, I didn't, I didn't ask for this. 
but the Lord will educate his own. Amen. I make no appeal for ignorance. I can tell you, he'll educate and qualify those who he's honored. God never sends a servant empty-handed. If they're ignorant, he'll make them wise. He'll have them stand still, be his instruments, whom he may thunder judgment or whisper benediction. They'll fit anywhere. If they're weighed on him, that's the a, that's a training. When will men let him alone? Why do we try to judge who's to be a preacher? Today you've got to go through their college. That simply means they're going to teach you to know something makes you own it. But the man that found that Pearl of Great Price didn't make it his. I can know everything Paul knows, but have nothing that Paul had. See, knowledge is in possession. This thing has to become a revelation of the heart. But today prayer's downplayed. Everything would just have some kind of degree. I'm telling you, God has nothing that demands a degree. I'm not appealing for ignorance. I'm just telling you, God, God adjusts those that he called. Now listen to the irony. This might have been spoken by Elijah. By Elijah, hear this prophet. Come to Bethel, transgress. You're quite equal to it. Come dance on the church floor. Come turn the sacraments into rites. The church into a circus. See, men preach good message. But let that flesh perform before they ever got there. My, my grandson just really come, my youngest one. I've been praying with them boys. They, 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 they're very talent equipped. That youngest one, he sell it in his bad breath. I'm telling you, he, he, he is that kind. Of, he's here. Everybody in this building, he'd know him when he left. And never forget their name. But God has wonderfully saved him. He's going to a church. He said, Pastor, a, a pap, he calls me. He said, he preached a good sermon. But he comes out of that tan in parlor. One morning brought a motorcycle into the church and said everything that goes on before. I never go there till he preaches. Amen. said, am I wrong? said, I can't pay no tithe into this place. said, I send it down there at the school of Christ. He said, I just can't pay it in that place. I know you say take it to church. I said, son, that's no church. I don't, don't, don't take it in there. I'm a steward. I'm responsible. I said, I'm responsible. For how this, for, I'm investing for the king. Amen. I'm responsible. But all of this, he said, he, he'll preach a good sermon many times. But you know, but he may preach the good message, but preceded by great display of the flesh. As if you can turn this on, thing on and off like a hydrant. Oh, those, those, what they call them, them uh, muscle bounds. You know, you had them everywhere. Brother Duke tell me about, he went to one of them. You know, power, what they call them? Huh? Yeah, power groups, half naked up there, you know, blowing up water bottles, breaking blocks on the head with nothing in that head. You can block anything on it. <laughs> Amen. But he said he is there, and a devil possessed him. I, I made it type verbatim, but this, I, my pastor told me, he, you know, he said, he's telling me, he said, this is what you say <laughs> when the gospel really come. Amen. He knew better because he's raised right. But got caught, so he's there, and a devil-possessed boy just turning inside out. And they took that boy and threw him on that platform, and every power team run off that platform. Every one of them. They, they, they can bend a rod with their hands. They can blow up a hot water bottle. They can make a block on their head. But when that devil showed up, that power team's gone. I said, the power team's gone. I saw that mess. I said, I saw all that a walk. This is reality, folks. I said, this is reality. Amen. Oh, bring, he said, at Gilgal, multiply transgression. That is, around the altar, display your iniquity, carry on with your professional or fleshly madness under the guise of worship. I said, under the guise of worship. You know I'm telling you the truth. Bring your sacrifice every morning. You tithe every three years. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offering. Amos 4, 4, and 5. What a partial program that is, folks. I said, what? A sacrifice every morning, tithe every three years, sacrifice of thanksgiving, proclaim and publish a free offering. There's one thing wanting in that program, and for the want of that, the whole thing's worth nothing. And that's a sin offering. No call to repentance. No, no, just come play games with God. 
No call to repentance. Nothing. Listen. They'll come with sacrifice every Sunday morning as donors to God. I've watched them. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about out there in that carol charismatic world. I'm talking about right in our churches. They'll come every Sunday morning. Oh yes, they'll be here. Amen. As donors to God, they'll come with service, sacrifice of thanksgiving the eleven. They'll put money into treasure. But where's the penance? Where's the brokenness? Where's true repentance? The presence of agony in the inner life. Yesterday, that, that message of the Holy Spirit said repent. Oh my God. God, repent, repent. Men went to hell while we played games. When Zion travails, not when it has a hoopla, but when Zion travails, they're born. Where is that travailing spirit? Where is that agony anymore? Where is that that holds on? Most worship is partial, limited to what people like. They don't come because they like the preacher, but they like the choir. Amen. They don't like the choir, but I like to hear Brother Schultz. Amen. Or, or I like to be there because so many friends there just oh, love them. See, it's only, only churchgoers, most of them only want a partial religion. That's all. Some attention has to be paid to customs, so we do it. To habit, so we use it. Use of life. Hymns must be sung. And for a little small time, there has to be the smell of sanctity about what we do. There has to be. For a little while. Now, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the charismatic. I'm talking about classical Pentecostals. I'm talking about things that right under our nose. All this religious going on is possible, but it never reaches the throne of God. Never. Such religion doesn't produce holiness. It never gets you on the boundary of calculation and selfish adjustment. We come for what we like. The most sacred song is not accepted if it's only the sacrifice of a song. The publican, broken hearted, crushed, wounded and crying, God be merciful me a sinner, sings in his sob, praises God in a voice that's choked. Oh, yes, sir. Heaven heard him. I said heaven heard him. You got those that don't cry. Don't cry. My God, if you can't cry over these conditions, you, you're too hard. You're beyond hope. I said you're beyond hope if this doesn't make a man weep. Amen. Angels weep over it. Jesus wept over it. Why shouldn't me? When he's experienced mercy, that, that, that publican will rise liberated by the power of God. Beware of formality, of partial worship, of doing the church only those things we like to do. We like to sing. We like to hear sermons that soothe and encourage us. As far as we like to do, what could be more beautiful than our conduct in the sanctuary? Oh, it was wonderful. Amen. It's wonderful. My friend was in a big church. In fact, it's the Osteen's church years before he had it. And there's a lawyer in there that asked him to go to his church. And, and the man in that service, they're going through all this. They, they'd call up, say, young man, you come up here. Amen. And you, you come up here with him. Now, you, you, you prophesy or you talk in tongues and you interpret. Now that, you know, that's kind of, kind of how the thing, how, how the thing went on. And this man used one of the worst words. He used, you know, used God's name. One of the worst words said, isn't this the best church you've ever been in? I mean, that's the kind of, that's what flesh produces. I said, that's what flesh produces. You allow that kind of a mess to go on. Amen. I can tell you, be adultery in that house in a little while. You take a, show me a preacher more interested in a golf game than there's a prayer meeting. I'll show you a preacher with his eyes on somebody else's woman every time. It just cannot be otherwise. See, this is not a thing of the flesh. This is God at work. Amen. Where, whereas, you know, the Lord, looking upon this mechanical, bloodless sacrifice, said, I'm tired of such. Go deal your bread to the hungry. Go and be reconciled to your enemy. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. And I'll meet you in that house. Don't come here otherwise. When we do only what we like to do, we're not worshiping God. No, we're not worshiping God. Unless there's a touch of the agony of Christ, what we do is not acceptable with God. Have you, 
I hear you have thanksgiving, you have punctuality, you have music, singing, and the Lord turns it into an ironic taunt. That is the very opposite of what they thought. Come to Bethlehem transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgress. Bring your sacrifice every morning, your tithe every three years. Be very punctual in your payment. After you've gone through the mechanics, go home with the charge that God found you a liar. You never worship me. You never worship me. You worship what you liked. You, it's a partial thing. You went there because there's certain things you like. You never went there to find me. They that hunger and thirst will see God. Amen. They'll see God. Others will see every cobweb in that building. Amen. They'll see everything wrong. They know if somebody missed a note up there. They heard it. I don't know what the note is, so that never bother me. But just the same, that's all they'll ever see. But that man come looking for God. I come here. I told the pastor, I said, this is the will of God. I knew last year it wasn't. How would you know it? He said it was. I believe him. Amen. Doesn't matter if there's 20,000 here. Amen. He's heard it wasn't. And so he didn't. But I said, this year you believe it is? I believe that too. I said, we're going to meet God. I don't know about you, but I have been met. I'm telling you. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> These two men of God have touched. They have touched the nerve. I, oh, yes. They never beat around the edge. They come straight at me. Amen. I'm sitting on that front seat. They touched the nerve. There had to be. It has to be, folks. It cannot. It cannot be any more of this. We've turned the corner. We're the last stretch. The man there with the flag's about to drop it. Amen. I said it's about to drop. The race is about over. Amen. Some attention. All this religion going on must be as possible but does not produce holiness. It never gets beyond the boundary of calculation and selfish adjustment. Amen. The most sacred song is not accepted. Now, unless there's a touch of that agony, as we said, when will Amos come to cut us down in the divine wrath? When will he come, amen, to raise us up when we've confessed our sins and sought that forgiveness? To call to repentance those who've been preachers. Oh, my God. Amen. What an awful thing. I preached a camp meeting for a couple of years. Next year, I couldn't go. And they never called me no more. But the man said, uh, the, the, the superintendent and one wanted me to come, but said, to vote against, said, you, uh, the board made up all the preachers. And they said, he don't ever preach to nobody but preachers. <laughs> preachers like to preach at people. But don't preach at me. Don't preach at me. Oh, my God. What an awful day. When we can't preach to preachers, then no need in preaching to people, folks. No, no. This church will live or die because of you and I in this room this morning. Yes, sir. Everything about it lives or die. Amen. Surely this cannot be an impeachment. All of you and I in this room, as men and women of God, we must ask, have I omitted from my message the sin off and the trespass off, the sign of personal criminality? Have I, have I, have I called them? Amen. Have I called that church to repentance? Have I dealt with those things? Amen. As a man of God, you know, I, I, I didn't know. I, I never passed. I've been an evangelist for three years. I went to Beaumont. I thought, well, I don't know nothing about this, but there's men there have been 40 years, had four little churches in Beaumont. All I found was their scorn. They didn't want another church there. Might interfere with those 30 people they had, and they didn't want me there. You know, and, and I, I took nothing away, big or little. If God's there, that's all that matters. But the presbyter come and told me, said, we don't want another church here. I said, then you and God are on a different page, because he told me to come here. Amen. And, and the whole thing turned against me. I had no money, a wore out car, two children, a wife, and the will of God. Amen. That's all I had when I come there. Amen. But the whole system, I thought I'd learn from them. Well, there wasn't no learning, learning from them because they excluded me. Then I found out I didn't want to know what they knew. I didn't care how long they'd been in it. I, I didn't want to know. But what I learned. I learned through a lot of ditches. I fell in a lot of them. Amen. But all of it, I was honest. Amen. I was looking for God. I went down a lot of alleys looking for Him. It's so narrow. I couldn't turn around. I had to back back out of the thing. Amen. Impossible. But I went down that alley looking for God. Amen. I said, I went down that alley looking for God. Amen. 
Every man, listen, how, listen, beauty, listen, there, if we just understand, if I'm only, we must ask this question, have I omitted my message? Am I only a decorator of the external life, or am I truly seeking to be purified in heart, cleansed at the fountain of my being? What is it? Do I just want to look good before men? I preached a conference in Beaumont. About 500 preachers were there. My message was a pretender. I mean, I took Ananias and Sapphira. And I said to those preachers, I said, very easy for me to get in this pulpit, get a tear coming down this cheek, and a little brokenness in this voice, and make you believe I'm a holy man. But I said, does your wife believe you're holy? Amen. Amen. In the morning, under every service, does that wife believe you're holy? That, that's the key to it all. Anybody can get up here and look holy, but what does your family think? What is it why? People that see you under the duress of times and everything else. This is a continuous life. It's not something that happened to me in the house of God. This is a continuous life. Amen. Listen, every man must answer the question himself. It lies in the power of every man to insult and dishonor God, but it lies in the power of every man to exalt the name of Christ. What are we going to do? That's where we are. Now the Lord will be gracious. He adopts a word and repeats it. Now how did Amos come to know this word seek? Hear this rough farmer. How did he come to know? Here comes a rough, blunt prophet, and he takes up Isaiah's word and represents the Lord as saying, Seek me and you shall live. He takes up the very word of Isaiah. I mean, our Savior said, Seek and you'll find. Then he represented himself as a seeker, though you've got people say it is legalism for you to really seek God. All of a sudden, for you to give persistence to your life. But he represented himself as a seeker. He said, the son of man who's come to what? Seek, find that he is, and save the lost. That's why he came. Now the word seek indicates something that cannot be done, folks, in a careless manner. The word seek is full of passionate desire. What woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, does not light a candle, sweep the house, seek diligent till she find it. She don't seek leisurely, easily, can, uh, occasionally as the mood strikes. She makes it the one business of her life. No, nothing else. She makes it the business. We must seek the divine presence as men seek silver. You're never going to find him if you don't. Many shall seek to enter in, shall not be able. Why? Because they don't seek me in the right spirit, or they may wait too long. There's a time you can believe, there's a time when you can't believe. That's the unpardonable sin. God deal with you this morning, neighbor. Amen. You walk out, he don't have to deal again. I said, he don't have to deal again. Amen. The seeking is lost, either for the lack of diligence, or because the Lord has risen and shut that door. Amen. Have how have you sought the Lord? Intellectually, speculatively, metaphysically? Have you asked questions concerning him which intellectual answers may be given? Or have you gone to him who is the door and said, I will not leave this door until it's open from the inside. No, I'm not, I'm not going nowhere until that door is open from the inside. That's the only kind of people that ever make it with God. Not those that play games with men. None of them. Amen. This is all. Amen. Knock. On the door it's written. Knock and it will be opened unto you. Seek and, and you shall find. But on the path that leads to the door rather, it says seek and you shall find. See, now, long, listen, to call to repentance those who have been preachers and leaders, amen, what an awful thing. See, the, the, at this point, see, with, with the Amos, you come to, to the funeral dirge. Hear you this word, which I take up against you. Even a lamentation, O house of Israel, the virgin of Israel is fallen. She shall no more rise. She's forsaken upon the land. There's none to raise her up. Amos chapter 5, 1 and 2. It is as if a man was present at his own funeral, hearing those solemn words, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. The whole lot is over with. The race is run. This is a dirge. 
over the fallen house of Israel. So fallen that it's spoken of in the feminine gender, the virgin of Israel. Beauty withered, promises come to nothing but fruits of darkness. That's the message of the man of God. How is it with our life? We, we too live. We also must die. Amen. Every man must answer the question. I said, every man must answer, answer the question. Now the word, Lord's grace, he adopts the word, that word seek, as we had. He adopts that word. Amen. Seek and you shall find. The Lord will not be found by those who do not seek him with their whole heart. No, no. He, doesn't, he has no time for the careless folks. No, you say, I don't have time to pray. You're in the wrong business. You're in the wrong business. Paul had time to take a three-year tour to a desert to hear from God. And I've found in 56 years of preaching this gospel, there is no time lost in that journey when you stop to pray. No, no. I said, there is no time lost in that journey when you stop to pray. Take time to know God. You'll find that time stops for you, and it'll all come together. He does not stand for cross-examination. God doesn't. He doesn't by the intellect. He's not to be victimized by interrogators. He does not offer himself to be analyzed or criticized by intellectual faculty. The Lord will stop nowhere but the door of a broken heart. Nowhere. Doesn't matter what men say. He will answer no question that's marked by the modesty and trembling of a contrite spirit. Here is a man that I look to. He that is of a broken and a contrite spirit that trembles at my word. You read that in Isaiah, and it is as if God had stepped out on the balcony of heaven and looked at the universe that he had created. He said, all of these, billions and billions of them, my hands has made. But they, he was not impressed. He just looked. He said, I could do it again. But here's a man that I looked to. It's broken and a contrite spirit. Trembles at my word. Pastor told me, preached a message in this pulpit. Great stern among saints. He'd come down to pray. And the man stopped him. I won't tell him a joke. God pity. I said, God pity such in this house. God is saying, I'll take time. I'll quit making worlds for broken. But I close leaving this thought in your mind. Doesn't matter what that crowd out there does. It doesn't matter what Mr. Dollar does and waving his money and saying, uh, you know, that the word comfort, when God spoke the whole word comfort, means to be comfortable. How can you be comfortable if you don't have a big house and a big car? Doesn't matter what they say. They don't hurt us. It is us in this room who will determine whether that river flows or not. Somebody will because it's going to flow. But the question is, will it be you?